time pressure and I forgot the punchline. The punchline is if you don't want the other side to know something, don't use it, okay? Don't make use of information that you don't want the other side to have. And uh, what we told the ACBA was if there's some information about <coughs> the, uh, um, the stockpile of the United States that you don't want the Russians to know, don't tell your negotiators, okay? Don't tell the, uh, the people who are negotiating with you, your, the employees, don't tell the ACDA at all, okay? Uh, and if you want to give the Russians a hint, but you don't want them to be sure, give the negotiators the hint, okay? But don't tell them for sure. Is that the device? That's the summoning device, yeah. But I think they're all come. They all came. <laughs> I enjoy it. It's better than Cyrus. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's get started. I'm going to tell you about stochastic games. I'm going to tell you about discounted stochastic games today and tomorrow. Abraham Neyman uh, will tell you also about stochastic games, uh, but we've uh, more or less coordinated not to repeat ourselves. So I will uh, focus on the discounted case, um, and I will look at a very simple, finite framework, and Abraham will tell you more about extensions. All right, so before I give you any type of motivation, uh, just as Guillaume did it this morning, I'll give a few words. Let me just first define a stochastic game. In fact, let me draw a timeline because I'm going to give you an overview since the beginning of stochastic games, 1953, Lloyd Chaplet, until today. All right, of course, I will just fly 29 years apart each time because I don't have that much time to tell you about this large literature. But anyhow, so the first time it was introduced, it was introduced by Lloyd Chaplet, who was pretty much your age. Um, and uh, he, it is a generalization of repeated games. Um, so what, what are the ingredients? Let me just define it formally. So a stochastic game uh, starts with, uh, this is the novel ingredients relative to repeated games that we've heard of today and in the last few days. Starts with a set of states. I will take them today and probably at the beginning of tomorrow's lecture to be observable. So when we're in a given state S, it is common knowledge that we're in that state. Right? All the other elements are pretty standard. They're just like in repeated games. So we're going to have actions for each player, will be, which will be in finite sets, AI. And uh, we're going to have a set of player, of course. So I will be in some set I, finite as well. <coughs> I use also I for the cardinality of that set. And uh, I need two more ingredients. One is standard. I'm going to talk about the payoff of player I in state S, given action profile A, so I use R for reward. When I say payoff, typically I mean the discounted sum. So R is for the flow payoff, if you want. And finally, I need to define a law of motion across from, from one state to the next. So we're going to be quite general here. We're just going to have for each state we're currently in and each action profile that players take we will have a distribution over the state tomorrow. I will also use T for states. S and T are states. T is for tomorrow. All right? That's the mnemonic. Okay? But S is also for state today. Okay. So. <laughs> Good. All right. So these are pretty much all the ingredients, of course. I'm, as I said, I'm going to focus on the case where we discount payoffs and we will have a common discount factor, delta. 
right? So that's the basic environment that uh, Chaplet considered. And um, it's been uh, very, uh, very rich literature. Um, the game will be infinitely long. Exactly. So, so, exactly. so I should add infinitely long. I will use n for the periods, etc. Everything else is just like in a repeated game. All right. One, one, one. Uh, I never got a chance to ask Lloyd Chaplet why he calls these stochastic games because people always get confused. These need not be stochastic. All right. This could be deterministic. All right. Special case is a repeated game. You have a single state. Another special case is Markov decision processes or you know uh, problems of one player, uh, Markov problems where you have a single player. Okay. So it's a it's a very rich environment. And here's the time to mention that for economists, it's uh, somewhat of a uh, surprise that this is not uh, a model that has been um, used more, because pretty much any application you can think of of repeated game truly should be a stochastic game, all right? Bob Arman talked about disarmament. Martin next to me said, this is a stochastic game, right? Because we have this stockpile of weapons, all right? Yes, and that stockpile evolves over time as a function of the actions we take. All right. Um, when you do political economy, when you're thinking about an incumbent and a challenger, it's a stochastic game. Alternating move games are stochastic games. Um, in macro, when you're thinking about public finance, you have savings. So the, the worker has hidden savings. It's a stochastic game with hidden state variables, how much he saved, or his productivity, his labor income. These are state variables as well, if there is any type of persistence. So it's pretty hard, in fact, once you start thinking about it, it's pretty hard to think of games which are not stochastic games and truly repeated games. All right? Typically, we teach Cournot and we say, you know, think about OPEC. OPEC is also a stochastic game because there is only that much oil in underground. And hoteling, in fact, modeled that problem already in the 20s as a stochastic game. All right? So, um, well, realize that there was a state variable, I should say. So the stochastic games were actually used before Chaplet without necessarily using the word. In fact, when you're thinking about um, extensions, uh, there are some extensions I'm not going to talk about. One is to infinite state spaces. There's been lots of papers on this. Uh, do Markov equilibria exist with infinite states? That's something that John Levy, who graduated here, worked on not so long ago. There's been lots of papers on that. Um, there are games which are in continuous time, so-called differential games. Um, Abraham will tell you about continuous time stochastic games. And these predate stochastic games, differential games uh, that, um, so games with a state variable in continuous time go back to the 20s as well. 1925 was the first um, stochastic game in continuous time. Um, so these are obvious extensions that I'm, I'm not going to talk about, right? Um, I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm ignoring some others. Yes, an important one, of course, I'm not sure it's an extension, but a variation is to look at other payoff criteria. As I said, I'm going to focus on discounting. And as usual, I'm going to let delta go to 1. But uh, Abraham will also tell you about other um, ways of evaluating infinite streams of payoffs, limit of means. Uh, just as uh, Bob talked about before. All right, so I'm not going to go that route, but to a large extent, uh, the literature is at least as rich in the undiscounted case as it is in the discounted one. All right, it's probably even richer. Okay, so um, good. So before I start going forward, let me just say a uh, couple more things um, about uh, um, what we're going to do. The question, if it, by the way, if there is any question, just interrupt me. All right. Raise your hand or just interrupt me. So an important thing also that I need to specify is what solution concept I'm going to use. Now, Chaplet was interested in zero-sum game, just as we had this morning the lecture of Bob. So uh, he was interested in the value and optimal strategies. I will talk a little bit about zero-sum game, but very little because my focus is on non -zero, the non-zero-sum case. Right, so I'm not going to talk about optimal strategies in the sense of zero-sum game very long. Um, beyond zero-sum, you might be interested in stationary strategies. You probably have heard of those. I'll come back to them. These are strategies or Markov strategies, you wish. So um, strategies 
that would only take as input the current state and would disregard the past actions that were played. Okay. Um, I think Alistair will talk about Markov equilibria in his lectures on experiments. I won't. I think Markov equilibria are very interesting because in those games uh, where the state evolves over time, um, you know, playing myopically whatever maximizes your payoff, even if you're alone, is not the right thing to do for a given discount factor. And so as a benchmark, the counterpart to, stat to, to the repetition of static Nash uh, that applies in repeated games, the counterpart to it is Markov perfect equilibrium. So just ignore the past and play in a way that depends on the current state. Um, Markov perfect equilibria are very attractive for applied economists. So people in IO love them because it allows them to give sharper predictions for the purpose of uh, estimation. Um, and of course, just as for, st for, for, for repeated game, it's a useful first step. If you want to understand what we can do with uh, strategies that are history dependent as the ones that Eric described in the first lecture, we'd better know what happens if we don't uh, cooperate in that sense if we're just trying to play the counterpart of static Nash. But I'm not going to talk about Markov equilibria very much today. Okay. Um, what I'm going to talk about subgame perfect Nash equilibrium when we have observable uh, actions and perfect public equilibria. I define those for those of you who haven't seen them later on today when there is some signals. I haven't talked about imperfect public monitoring right there, but I will introduce it later on. Okay, so I will introduce the possibility that players don't see the actions, but that they see public signals, just as what, uh, was it Larry or George introduced when they did uh, reputations. All right, so we will allow for public monitoring as well. Good. So in, solution, in terms of solution concept, we'll definitely do subgame perfect and PPE if we have imperfect uh, information about moves. Uh, and we're using the, cr the standard criterion of discounting. Okay, so let me just say, he introduced the class of games, but what did he show? What did Chaplet show? He, his contribution is, is, is manifold in that paper. First, he introduced that class of games, and that's already, I think, an important contribution. Second, he showed that in this class of zero-sum stochastic games, um, there exists a value, and there exist optimal strategies that are stationary. So uh, that means players can restrict attention to Markov or stationary strategies when they're trying to defend the value, whether player one or player two. And last but not least, what Chaplet, where Chaplet was really, I think, uh, one, uh, what was really, really uh, innovating was he reduced the analysis of the dynamic game to a collection of one-shot games. Right? He realized this is an infinitely repeated, infinitely, you know, it's infinitely long game, it's awfully complicated. If you thought about the dimension of the, the set of strategies uncountable, uh, can we think about them in terms of auxiliary one-shot games where we augment somehow the flow payoff with some continuation? All right. Now, at the very same time, Richard Bellman was doing that for the one-player case. All right. This was independent and concurrent work. Uh, Bellman published his, his paper on uh, Markov, on, on the, you know, the Bellman question if you want. In 52, the book came later, uh, Chaplet was working at the same time on that. Chaplet is an extension. I mean, Bellman was marginal in some respects. Chaplet was marginal in others. Um, um, in particular, Chaplet was doing everything in, with finite and, and, and Bellman was, was doing a little more generally. But so not only was it for, you know, was it innovative because we didn't even do that before Bellman uh, or Chaplet uh, for the one player case, but for multiple player cases in repeated games, it took many years to do the same. So, Abra Pierce and Stachetti uh, are names that come to mind when you're thinking about analyzing the repeated games in terms of a collection of one shot games. They're not exactly the same uh, set of state variables because here the set of states, in a sense, is, is, is given exogenously. So, there is obviously some value in what Abra Pierce and Stachetti did, which is, which is quite important. Um, Drew um, and David Levine, uh, Food Mag Levine, I'll come back to that, also um, exploited this type of decomposition to say something about the limiting set as delta goes to one. And of course, in, for those of you who do contract theory, Thomas and Voron and others did that. But all that came in the 80s in terms of repeated games. All right? So um, Eric's proof, for instance, was not using that. It was really explicitly describing strategies, uh, how we play, 
as a function of the history. It was summarized by some stages or phases, but it still was very constructive. And Chaplet was already trying to find a way which was more recursive. All right, so that's, I think, the three major contributions of Chaplet. Um, but let me just now move forward a few years, not much, and go to 1957. And talk about a game which is called the Big Match. Any questions? I see a question. The person next to Billig is pointing something. Uh, what? What is the P? P, good. P is a probability distribution over tomorrow's state, given the current state and the action profile being played. All right? So if today we're in this state and, you, and we play that action profile, tomorrow's state will be drawn according to this distribution. Could be deterministic, could be random, could depend, could be independent of the actions could depend on the actions, could be independent of the states, you name it. All right? It's a very general environment. Any other questions? There are lots of special classes of games. And by the way, I should say that I'm going to go forward in time and give you a collection of nice examples from the literature. None, none is mine, uh, but they're remarkable. And I'd love to do like Bob Arman did this morning, give you a collection of examples and then give you a general theorem. But that's not the way it works in stochastic games because we have a bunch of examples that illustrates all the difficulties and this is why we talk about them because we need young people to come up with a general theorem. All right? We have some general theorems when we strengthen the assumptions quite a bit. So I'm going to give you a general theorem which covers none of the interesting examples. <laughs> all right? Good. So let me... I have so many panels, I shouldn't erase that. But then again, this notation is sufficiently standard that you should be able to deal with that. All right, so the first example I'm going to talk about, as I said, is 1957. That's an example introduced by someone called Gillette. And it's the big match. So big match is a very simple game. And the reasons for why it's famous, it pains me to say, is for what... Uh, of for why it is uh, really tricky, mathematically speaking, in the undiscounted case. And that's precisely what I'm not going to tell you about. All right? But I'd still be able to show you why there is a problem of continuity at delta equal, equal, equal to 1. Equal to one right? So the big match is the following two-player zero-sum game. I told you I'd start with zero-sum, but we're going to leave it soon. I'm just going to give you two examples of those. So player 1 uh, uh, chooses uh, either top or bottom. Player two chooses left or right. And these are the payoffs. He wants to match. Player two wants to mismatch. All right? These are player one's payoff. And um, here's the change relative to a standard repeated game. I put some stars here. And what I mean by that is that actually if we ever play bottom left, the game ends and we're going to get zero forever. I shouldn't say it ends. Uh, I should rather say we s we're stuck with that payoff in all future periods. Similarly, there is a star here, which means if we ever play bottom right, we're stuck with the one forever. All right? So formally speaking, this game has three states. The one we start in, which is this one, where we actually have two actions each. And those two absorbing states which occur as soon as player one plays bottom. All right? These are very stark transitions. They're entirely state, well, they're, they're entirely controlled by player one. If he ever plays bottom, the game sort of ends. All right? And players are interested in maximizing their payoff in this game. Is the game clear? Right? So as long as I play top, we stay in this state. Okay? And as soon as I play bottom as player one, uh, we, we end the game, all right? And the story that, um, that Gillette gave, or, or Blackwell, I should mention that Black, uh, Gillette was the one who suggested it, and Blackwell and Ferguson, it, it, took, it took those folks, well, it took the literature 11 years to come up with a solution to this game, all right? But not the solution I'm going to talk about, because the solution we're going to talk about, that takes us two minutes. All right? They were interested in the undiscounted case. The discounted case was pretty much a special case of what Chaplet had done. Okay, and the, so, so the story is as follows. Player 1 says 0 or 1. Player 2 says 0 or 1 instead of top, bottom, left, right. And if player 1 ever says bottom, 
it's the big match, all right? That's the one which determines all ulterior uh, interactions, all right? So if you take bottom, you basically go all in, and if you're right, you get one forever. If you say zero, this is it. You're never going to get anything anymore, all right? So that was the motivation of Blackwell and Ferguson. These were not economists, okay? So how are we going to solve that game? So we're going to use the result of uh, Chaplet, which says that this game has a value in stationary strategies. So we're going to think about if you were to play in a stationary way, so I'm going to take that as given, all right? I'm not going to prove that optimal strategies exist within the set of uh, stationary one. I just use that. I'm going to think about what should be the mix between top and bottom and left or right if you play a one or play a two. Now the obvious observation is that neither player wants to play pure. Right? If player 1 was playing B, as long as the game hasn't ended, it would end very quickly if he played B. But if he played B to begin with, then clearly player 2 would play left, leaving player 1 with 0. And, um, and clearly that doesn't sound very attractive to player 1. He would, la he would rather deviate to top in that case. All right? Similarly, if he kept, kept on playing top, the game wouldn't end. But if that was the equilibrium strategy, player 2 would play right all the time, and that would give zero to player one. That's not attractive either. You can similarly see that if player two's behavior was predictable, we would actually, um, uh, player one would be able to take advantage of it, so we're not going to get an equilibrium in pure strategies. All right? So we're going to precisely use the decomposition uh, that uh, Shapley introduced to think about the value as being a solution of a system of equation uh, involving the strategies of player one and player two. All right, so these are the, my, my notation for, for strategies. Some P is some, some, some number in 0, 1, and Q is a number in 0, 1, summarizing the strategy of player 1 and 2. So let's think about the value for this game. So let's solve these equations, all right? That's as hard as math as we're going to have today, um, solving this kind of uh, equation. So if you play a 1 um, and you play top, then you guarantee that the game is not going to end. All right, so you're going to get, with probability Q, 1 today. I'm time averaging, I mean, I'm, I'm normalizing payoff by 1 minus delta, as usually. So I'm going to get Q today. With 1 minus Q, I'm going to get 0. But the game will go on tomorrow, and we're going to get a delta V right there. All right? On the other hand, if I play bottom, I take chances. I, uh, I'm gambling, and so either... With probability Q, I'm going to get 0, or with probability 1 minus Q, I'm going to get 1. And so my payoff is simply 1 minus Q. Is that clear? All right. If I say, is that clear, you might also say it is wrong, because I do typos, or I do mistakes. So if you see any, let me know. All right. So this is from player 1's point of view. I'm actually, let's, let's, let's go on. Let's think about player 2's point of view. So from player 2's point of view, it's a cost. All right. So if he plays left, then, well, whether he plays left or right, in fact, with probability P, the game will go on. So the cost of player 1 will always, or player 2, will always have a term delta P times V, right? Because with probability P, we're going to go to, to the following period. But on top of that, with probability 1 minus P, if he plays left, um, he will get 0. The cost will be zero. All right. Um, so which one is it? So it, exactly. So if I if I play left, I'm going um, to get. So the cost is. So if I play left with probability p, I'm gonna get the one and the delta p v tomorrow. And with probability one minus p, I'm gonna get zero. Is that clear? And if I play right, what am I gonna get? Well, with priority uh, P, the game goes on, but I get zero. With priority one minus P, um, I'm going to get uh, one forever. Is that right? No. See, I. Sorry. That's player one's. That's player two's cost. Yes. Player two's cost. I wanted to continue my equality. It doesn't mean it's right, but I'm thinking about the cost. Right, I'm thinking about cost because it's minus. Sorry, yeah. Exactly. Yes, Eric. You, you, you might have said this already, but you are implicitly assuming that Q and P are strictly between zero and one. Correct. So that's why I was saying they don't play pure. Yeah. I was arguing first that they're not playing pure because if they played pure, so Q 
given that first step, I can actually now equalize payoffs, right? Are these questions clear? Yeah? So immediately see from the first line, by the way, what V is. That's, that's a tricky, that's a mean system of equations, right? I have V equal to 1 minus delta Q plus delta V, so I immediately get V equal to Q, all right? And I also have then Q is equal to 1 minus Q, which means V is actually has, V had better be equal to 1 half, all right? Sounds like a, a great game. You're going to say, okay, what was the big deal about zero-sum game? It's just the same, same answer without the stars. All right? Yeah? Makes no difference. All right? Well, it does make a difference when I'm trying to solve for P. If I solve for P, I'm just not going to do the derivation. Trust me on this. It's 1 over 2 minus delta. You can check. All right? Uh, and so in particular, what happens is this is not at all 1 half. All right. As delta goes to 1, this goes uh, to 1. All right. You want to play top. Why? Because playing, if you're very patient, playing bottom is a very dangerous proposition. Right? If you put too much weight on bottom, player 2 will just keep on playing left because sooner or later he's going to catch you. And the time it takes for a given fixed P will be bounded and as far as delta goes to 1, that's just going to be very tricky for you. All right. So we see something that is quite unusual, namely um, uh, relative to, uh, to standard repeated games, there are some games, we see that optimal stationary strategies depend on the discount factor. That was a new thing. And still might say, all right, but in terms of the value, I don't really care. I'm going to immediately see that that's, the second example is going to show, th show that this, is, this, this result is not generally either. The one, uh, one thing I want to point out, which really startled people in 57, it started with everyone, was what happens for the undiscounted case. So I don't want to say too much because I don't want to take the thunder away from Abraham's lecture. But if you're thinking about what happens when delta goes to 1, and you think, you'd hope, that somehow the limit strategies would be optimal in some undiscounted version. Bob gave you some definition of what it means to be optimal in an undiscounted limit. Uh, you see that you have a problem because if you really think that P is 1, P equal to 1 cannot be optimal for player one, all right? Because if truly P were one for player one, and truly player one played therefore top in every period, player two would always play right, which gives player one's value, uh, which would give player one a, a, a payoff of zero. Now, you might say perhaps the value is zero, but that sounds, that's, that sounds unlikely, all right? Sounds unlikely that somehow the value would drop from one half to zero. But this required proof, and so this example showed that once we go to the undiscounted game, if the value is continuous, the optimal strategies can no longer be stationary. Chaplet's result does not extend to the undiscounted case. And it was Blackwell and Ferguson's contribution to show that in this example and in the class of games related to that one, the value is continuous in delta, but we need to look at a class of strategies which are history dependent. Right? So the strategy uh, that Blackwell and Ferguson constructed is delightful. All right? So as I, it really pains me not to show it to you. I have lecture notes. Uh, I uh, ask Shani to send them to you so that if you really want to know why it is delightful, you can, you can read it. All right? It's just a beautiful proof. Okay, while well, this one is entirely straightforward and an application of, of Chaplet. Good. So we see that actually adding, going from a, a repeated game to, an to, a to, a, to a stochastic game makes a difference in strategies. I'm going to show you now it makes a big difference in payoffs as well. Uh, let me just make one, um, one, more, one more remark here. This is a game which we call an absorbing game. So there are lots of different types of stochastic games. Um, the ones where all states but one are absorbing, we call them absorbing games. Absorbing games are still not understood. All right. As simple as they sound, uh, we still don't know in a general absorbing game um, as w when we go to non-zero sum, I should say. When we go to the non-zero sum, we'll see in a second, we don't know what the set of equilibrium payoff is. Okay, so let me make a trivial change here to show you how drastically outcomes can change. Of course, it's not a minor change that I'm going to make. Um, I'm going to uh, change just one entry in my payoffs. See which one I want to add. Yes, I'm going to add a star 
right there. Makes the game even easier, all right? Unless we play top right, the game is over. Okay? Unless we play top right, the game is over. Um, and again, it's not hard to see that players want to randomize. All right? If your play was predictable in the sense of being uh, pure, player, the other player would take advantage of you and, and the value would either be 0 or 1, depending on whose player we're considering. So that's not going to be a solution. So again, we will be able to equalize payoffs to solve this stochastic game, which is, again is an absorbing one. So uh, what do we get here? Uh, so let's take the cost point of view. So let's take the point of view of player two. So the value to player one, which is the cost of player two. Now, if he plays left, he ends the game as well. It's a strange game because both players can stop the game. It's no longer just one player that controls it. So if player, one play, sorry, if player two plays left, the game ends, and his cost will be, uh, will be P. Uh, because with probability P, uh, player 1 uh, will play top, and so the game ends with a 1. And with probability 1 minus P, the game ends, and we have a 0 right there. Is that clear? And what do we have here? Well, if he plays right, well then, with probability P, he gets 0 and the game goes on. So we have a delta PV right there. And with probability 1 minus P, uh, the cost will be 1. Does that sound right? So I can again solve, so now I have already, I, I'm not going to worry about Q. I we could solve for Q. What, I, what I'm curious about is, is, is V and P. So we immediately get that we have a quadratic here. So that was already uh, somewhat surprising for uh, reasons I'll make uh, clear in a second. So we have, we have this quadratic right there. So the value is equal to P is equal to that expression. And so that gives us, uh, 1 minus square root of 1 minus delta over delta. And that's just because I have a good memory. All right? Just didn't, didn't do it on the spot. Okay, so this is the value. And what we see, while the game is kind of symmetric, it's not quite symmetric because of the stars, but we see that as delta goes to 1, this goes to 1. So just because you have a game which is symmetric does, in, in terms of the entries does not all imply that the value will be one half. So here goes the conjecture that you might have had that to compute the value you just can ignore the stars. That, that's gone. All right. The strategies again are strategies which are far away from the ones in the repeated game. And the most startling thing, if you're a mathematician, right, an economist might say, oh, it goes to one. Um, a mathematician would say, wow, that's interesting that's, that this thing V does not have a Taylor expansion in 1 minus delta. All right? That depends on your background. All right? So that was the one thing that startled people. And you know, the reason why we might be interested in the behavior in terms of 1 minus delta, so if I'm thinking about how V delta looks like, it's going to play an important role if we're to understand exactly the, um, uh, the equilibrium payoff set or the, the, the relationship between V delta and V infinity. Uh, to borrow the notation of Bob this morning. So if we understand how things converge in the limit or whether they converge, we want to understand how V delta uh, behaves with one minus delta. So here I'm going to go forward in time um, to, uh, I'm not going to spend time on that, but there is a beautiful result by Buley and Kohlberg Which show, yes? I won't go there. I'm just going to state the result. P is different from Q. Right, so it's in the disposition of the stars. Right, so the stars are on the ones, not on the zeros. Ah, okay. okay, so that's that's what drives the asymmetry. Yes. Why do you have a p square? Why do I have a p square? Because because I'm using that p is equal to v, and so I immediately replace v by p, and so I get a p times p. The first p was coming. That the p was the first p was the property that the game goes on to the next round. V was the value that I'll get from the, the cost from player two's point of view from tomorrow's onward, that gives me a P. 
another p. So I get a p squared. All right. Buhler and Kohlberg showed uh, that uh, this was uh, this was not a fluke. This was not an algebra mistake. This can happen. And in fact, if you wanted a, a, a one over three, you could get a one over three. All right. If you want a one over n, you could get a one over n. There is a beautiful example exa exercise in the book that uh, Bob showed this morning, Merton Sorin Zamir, where there is a matrix, and depending on the size of the matrix, you just increase the matrix, and you're going to get all the rationals you want. All right, or rather, one over n for every n you can think of. All right, so not quite all rational, but all rational of the form one over n. All right. So Buhl and Kohlberg so show that actually, at least it, you. You could get any, any, any rational expansion you want, any coefficients you wanted, any power, I mean, you wanted, but at least by, by, doing what? by playing with the stage game entries, by the, with the entries. By just varying those a little bit? Or? By varying them a little bit and increasing the size of the matrix. So in fact, the data of the game in terms of the transitions and the number of actions gives us an upper bound on the lower integer in the ratio. Okay. Um, so you have to blow up the matrix if you want to get 1 over 17th. All right. I don't know exactly how many rows you need, but you need quite a few. All right. So these games are not crazy, but it already told us at the time that... Uh, told us, I'm not sure I should say told us. I wasn't born there, but there I was. So um, it told us that we have to be careful all right? in, in terms of uh, the asymptotic behavior, that it's going to be tricky. Buhl and Kohlberg, by the way, did not only prove that you have an expansion in uh, Prezo series, as Drew said, or in rational in fractional coefficients, but actually that showed that V delta converges um, to, to some limit, right? Finite games. Good. So let me now go to 1986. And now I want to finally give up the zero sum and talk about an example due to uh, Sylvain Sorin. Let's not talk about zero sum. Let's talk about non-zero sum. And the game was called Paris Match. Okay, because Sylvain Sorin is French. And you can use the big match because that was taken. All right. And Paris Match is a newspaper in France, which is, you know, not Sylvain's lectures. It's, uh, you know, something like the, I don't know what the English equivalent, the sun or something like that. Something like the sun. Right? And he was not the, the one who gave the name to it, by the way. It was Frank Tuchman who was the one who gave, gave it the name. All right, so here's the game. It's a very simple variation of what we did so far. So let's do the following. 1, 0, 0, 2, 1, 0, 0, 1. And I'll make this absorbing and this absorbing. So top, bottom, left, right. Okay? Simple zero sum, no, non-zero sum. And let me... Uh, let me first draw for you what's feasible. So what are the feasible payoffs? So we have uh, two action profiles that gives one zero, one that gives zero two, and one that gives zero one. So I have a payoff right there. I have one there. So that's the zero two. That's the zero one. That's the one zero. And let's try to do it correctly on scale. So we get this and this and this. So this is the set of feasible payoffs. Okay? They're very different because once we play 0, 2, the game is absorbed, so we'd better wait before we play top right if we ever want to play top right and we want to get a point in this weighted average. We'd better not start with 0, 2. That's not going to work. Okay? But they're nonetheless feasible. Now, the next thing I need to talk about is what's the min max payoff. All right? Just as in uh, non zero sum repeated game, we need to think about how low can the payoffs of the players be. And again, the zero sum is the auxiliary game we need to consider for that. So let's ignore for a second the entries for player two. Let's think about how low player one's payoff can be. So let's look at the zero sum payoff, zero sum game where uh, player one gets one, zero, zero, one. Well, that's precisely the big match. All right, the first game we looked at. So we know that player one's payoff can cannot be driven below one half. All right, so one half is a lower bound to what player one can get. For player two, it's a little different because now we're going to look at zero one and two zero. But if you had to take a guess, you'd say two thirds and you'd be right. You can write the equations. That's the correct guess. So we're going to get a two thirds here for player 
2. And so we get something above the diagonal. So this is the set of feasible and individual rational payoff. Right? And so you can ask, uh, is there a counterpart to Eric's Falk theorem? As delta goes to 1, are we going to get all the payoffs within that set? All right? And we're going to see that this is not true. You can get very little within that set. Perhaps that's surprising. So let's go through the, the, the reasoning. Um, so let me think about reasoning ab uh, about player 2's payoff first. In fact, I should uh, point out that uh, Sorin's result is remarkable because he's going to tell us what the set of Eklund payoffs is, even with Nash. All right? I'm going to follow him in that respect because I want to make clear it's not about subgame perfection. It's about the, the, the structure of the game. Even the set of Nash payoffs is a singleton in this game. So let's think about why. Um, so let's think about W being the highest Nash payoff in this game. Okay, for, from period zero, let's suppose, uh, let's not worry about soup versus max, it's, it's, it's actually achieved. Let's just take it for granted that it's a max. So let's think about the highest payoff that um, uh, player two can get. I'm not assuming stra stationary strategies, I'm going to focus on the strategies, the, the action choices in the first period when we play the Nash delivering W. All right, I'm going to call them P and Q as before. Just to be clear, this is not what we do in the second or the third period. This is what we do in the very first if we play the Nash equilibrium that delivers W. Okay? So the first observation I'm going to make is that P, the probability that player 1 assigns to top, must be strictly less than 1. Now why is that true? Well, if P were 1, oh, that would be delightful for player 2. If P were 1, player 2 would definitely want to play right in the first period, right? Because by playing right, the game would end and player 2 would get 2, okay? So that means that player 1, so that would say, that would imply that Q is 0, and that means that player 1's pay of V1 would be 0, and that clearly can't happen because 0 is below what player 1 can guarantee. It's below 1 half, okay? So P can't be... Uh, equal to 1, it must be strictly less than that. How about Q? Can I claim Q must be strictly less than 1 as well? Well, well, if Q were 1, then player 1 would love to play top because that would give him 1, which is an upper bound to what he can get. And we've already seen that P equal to 1 is impossible. Is that clear? So P must be less than 1 and Q must be less than 1. How about now, you know, I'm, I'm going towards showing that the action profile is totally mixed, it's completely mixed in the first period, uh, but the argument is a little more sophisticated than in a big match, so that's why I'm doing it a little more slowly here. How about, um, how about P being positive? Well, if P were 0, if P were 0, player 1 would play bottom for sure. Okay? Now let's think about what would that mean in terms of player 2's payoff. Remember, player 2 is supposed to be willing to play right. Okay? He's supposed to be willing to play right because Q is strictly less than 1. So we could compute player 2's payoff as if he was taking the right action. So if he plays the right action and player 1 plays the bottom action, BR uh, would result... And so the continuation payoff would be WBR, and it would be a Nash payoff. It would be a Nash payoff because it would be on path. BR would be on path. Okay? So player 2's payoff W would be equal to what he gets from playing right, which is delta this WBR. Namely, the continuation payoff he would get after BR, which would be a Nash payoff. And because it would be a Nash payoff, by assumption, it would have to be less than W itself. Okay? But if W is less than delta W, it means that W is zero, and we know that's not possible either. Is that clear? So we know that, so this is a contradiction. So P uh, must be greater than zero.
I know you're digesting, it's just, you know, after lunch, if you're willing to go over it again. Let's do that again. If P were zero, that would mean player one plays bottom. Okay? We already know that player two is willing to play right. He's willing to play right. In fact, he plays right with positive probability because we know Q is strictly less than one. So bottom right would be an action profile which is on path. So WBR, the Nash payoff that results after better B right, would be in the set of Nash payoffs and hence it would have been less than W. Because by assumption, we're focusing on the Nash, which gives the highest payoff to player two. And why, how did I get that W would be equal to w, WBR? Because player two would be willing to play right, and so I could compute his payoff W as if he's playing right. Okay? Hence, W equal to delta W, less than delta W, contradiction. How about Q being greater than zero? Well, if Q were zero, if uh, Q were zero, so if we were there, player one would never want to play top. All right? Playing top would give player one uh, zero forever. All right? So he can't be willing to play top. He would play bottom for sure. So, and so Q equal to zero would imply that P is equal to zero. And we've just argued that this is impossible as well. Okay, so that was a complicated way of proving that both players must actually mix. And so now we can use the same arguments of equalization that we've done in the simpler example of the big match and the variation on the big match. So what do they give us? Let's do that quickly. Oh, I don't want to erase my timeline, so I'm just going to have to uh, be careful here. So let's think about uh, player two's payoff W. So he must be indifferent between left and right. Yeah. So what does he get from playing left? With probability P, the game is over and he gets zero. With probability 1 minus P, the game, uh, he gets one today and the game goes on. Right? So W has to be equal to 1 minus P, 1 minus delta plus delta W, B left. And all this reasoning implied that W, B left, that continuation pay payoff after B, L being played, is a Nash payoff. All right? It's a Nash payoff because it does happen with positive probability, which means that this term right there is less than W itself. Okay, which I will use in a second. In fact, I'll use it right there. Okay? How about the second one? How about if he plays right? Well, if he plays right uh, with probability P, he's getting 2, which is great. And with probability 1 minus P, the game goes on, but he gets nothing today. So he's going to get W times W B right. Is that clear? Goes back to w. Yeah, that goes back to W, but I'm going to make it now immediately. I'm going to do that as well. <laughs> All right, just want to get rid of the, inequali the equalities. We'll work with inequalities. Okay? So let's just uh, work a little bit on that. So this one is, is, is nice. Uh, the other one I'm going to subtract 2 and add 2, so I'm going to get 2 minus w, I take the w on the other side, greater than 1 minus p, and then I have a 2, and then I have a delta w. So I have two inequalities, and so the, 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 the beauty of uh, Sylvain's argument is that now I'm going to cancel the p's, it doesn't matter what the p's are. I immediately get a relation between the w's, namely the product of the higher terms has to be larger than uh, the product of the lower terms, and the 1 minus p will cancel. So I'm going to get 2 minus w greater than 1, as times 1 minus delta plus delta w greater than, than what? the other side, which is a, a W times, sorry, no, where, where, where was it? That's the, that the a 2 minus a W here and a 2 minus de delta W that right there. Okay? 
and the 1 minus p cancel. And now the beauty is that the w, the w square will cancel right there. I'm going to get something in linear in W. And so if you're quick, you'll figure out that W is actually less than 2 thirds. So what Sylvain shows is that already player 2 cannot get more than 2 thirds. So we must be, the set of Nash payoff must be constrained in this line right there. And given the time, I'm not going to do the argument for player one. It's exactly similar. We're going to start with V being the highest Nash payoff for player one. And we're going to argue along the same lines that the first action profile, so the action profile played in the initial period, must be entirely mixed. And we'll do some elementary magic to prove that V is actually less than one half. Which will imply that the set of Nash payoff independently of delta is equal to the vector one half two thirds. The min max payoff. This is a simple zero sum game, uh, non zero sum game, where all we can do is the min max payoff. And it's still, you know, coming from repeated games, it still shocks me because we tend to think of if you can support something, surely you can support something on the northeast of it with, an, with, uh, with appropriate punishments. All right? Something like the phases that Eric described. We start over there, and then eventually we go, there. no, it does not work. All right? Why doesn't it work? What's the intuition uh, after the algebra? The intuition is to get something on the boundary, so to get something efficient, to get something along that line, which would be, uh, which, which, which would be the Pareto frontier. Player one has to agree to play top right. All right? So to get a, pay, pay a point on this boundary, we must play one of these three action profiles. Right? So the, the one zero here or there, or the zero two there. Okay? But we have a problem. Uh, if, we, uh, if I'm player two and I say, look, player one, why don't you play top so I, I can play right? And we're going to get the zero two. All right? uh, player one is not happy with that. All right? Clearly, uh, zero two, he's not willing to play. If he were to play top for sure, I would play right. And that would definitely give him a zero. He doesn't want the zero. He'll never, ever be amenable to play to, to a pure top right. Okay. So you say, how about top left, top right? He plays top and we do that combination. Now that's going to work because if he plays top, I surely will play right. How about if he, we say, you know, you alternate between bottom, top, and I play right. Well, whenever I know he's going to play top, I'm, uh, no, he's never going to be willing to play top. All right? So if I really played right, he's going to say, yes, uh, well, um, I'm sticking with bottom forever. All right? So there's no way to create incentives for player one to play top, for sure. Yes, Martin. Excellent. That was the next point I wanted to make. All right. How about if it was not of something? You say, this is so far away from a repeated game. You know, what fool would have thought that we would have some continuity with, uh, with repeated games? All right. I can do this 1 minus epsilon. Sorry. Uh, eps with epsilon, we get absorbed. With 1 minus epsilon, we're not. With epsilon, we get absorbed. With 1 minus epsilon, we're not. Still work. Now, the order of limit matters, all right? I'm fixing epsilon, all right? Uh, so I'm not entirely sure because that reasoning was delta independent, but I, I suspect that uh, the, the discount factor might start to kick in, all right? The problem, again, is the same. If you're very patient, um, player one is just not enthused about playing top, all right? Player two would love to play right and then get a two, all right? Which suggests something that no one has looked at, really, which is, um, is the Falk theorem that Eric described robust to small perturbations that would go towards stochastic games? Sorry? No, that's, that's the probability of absorption, which is very small. You, you don't have a microphone, I do, so... Oh yeah, I need, I need, I need absorption. I need absorption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then uh, if it gets irreducible, then, then this is the class of games. Thank you again, Martin. This is the class of games we actually understand. All right? So exactly. So you might argue it's not a small perturbation because once we're there, we're stuck. Right. Now, that 
paper was introduced by Sylvain Saurin to show that there was a discontinuity in the Nash payoff set. And again, I'm not going to tell you much about the undiscounted or the, the limit of means uh, Eklund payoff set, except to mention that it's contained in that segment. So discounting versus uh, undiscounted makes a big difference. So that's the discontinuity that the paper was uh, supposed to suggest. But I think if, 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 if you're familiar with the, the work of, of Drew and Eric of Folk Theorems in Repeated Games, the, the most starti startling discontinuity is perhaps the one I've just suggested right there. Right. Yes, Martin. Do yes, yes, they do. OK. Any questions on that, on these examples? Drew. Is the feasible set? Right, so in that case, that's, that's what it is. Because um, we can, here we had absorption, here we had non-absorption, this we had absorption, so we can generate, we, we, can, we can play with the one zero absorbing, non-absorbing to get those. Right, it might be, it might be tricky. With a public, yes, yes, throwing a public, yeah. That, that was too cheap. I, I crossed my mind, but I left Eric answer that. Okay. I'm not, uh, <laughs> Thank you. I'm you helped me out. To you helped me out. Like Thank you. Session. Yes. Just to confirm my intuition, so if, we, if two players were to play the Paris match game repeatedly, then we would get the ball. ball. If they played? The Paris match game repeatedly. The Paris match game repeatedly. So you're saying if it was a repeated extent, if it was a repeated stochastic game, yeah. If we somehow squeezed in, you know, we did some a random termination and we play it again. Yeah, then it would become an extensive form repeated game, right? If we really reboot, you're saying we, we stop and then we restart at stage zero. Then it would be repeated, ex you know, it would be what we call a repeated extensive form game. So, somewhat unusual because the extensive form would be possibly unbounded. Um, but I, I suspect that some, some of the results that, you know, we have some folk theorems for repeated form, re repeated games with extensive, I mean, repeated extensive form games, and I suspect some, some variants of them will apply. Okay. Any other questions? So I should mention that uh, even computing the min-max payoff, so in this example, it was two-thirds, one-half. So this was simple, but a formula for computing min-max payoffs in absorbing game has only been found very recently. So Laraki, 2010, the paper which finally told you this is the min-max value, the min-max payoff, in, uh, in absorbing games, all right? So even in absorbing games, we just figured out how to compute the two-thirds, one-half in general, all right? So having some notion of a Falk theorem or, w you know, clearly it's not a Falk theorem because we already know that it's just going to be that point, but having some notion of what's the characterization of equilibrium payoffs, even in absorbing games, just absorbing game, all right? The simplest, all right, ones, we don't have. Sorry? No, I'm, I'm saying, right, this is the Nash payoff. This is the Nash payoff set. The Laraki, Laraki is interested in the zero sum, which is equivalent to asking how would we determine the lowest candidate for the Ethereum payoff. Right. Yeah, there is no guarantee that we would actually get this min-max payoff as an Ethereum payoff. He just gives us a candidate for the min-max value. I mean, he gives us the min-max values, all right? Who knows whether one can construct an example where the min-max payoff is not in the Nash set. I'm not, I'm not aware of such an example, but it would be an obvious thing to try to construct. All right. Now, if you thought that this was intriguing, fascinating, exciting, requiring further thought, let me give you a... Uh, let's, let, let's, let's go another 29-year forward to 2015 and let me give you a last example which is even more disturbing all right which is due to uh, Ziliotto and Jérôme Renault and this one is a little more complicated that's why it's over there all right and that is annoying what's the trick ah the erasers 
I got really nervous right there. I was wondering, how, if I got it there in the first place, there's got to be a way. Okay, so this is the game they consider. It's not an, absorb it's not an absorbing game because it's a game where, it's, it's what we call an irreversible game. So let me just explain how we should read this tree. So the first period, player one is the only one to move and either he moves left or he moves right. And if he moves left, the game is over, giving both payoffs, both players a payoff of one. If on the other hand he plays right, we enter this 2 by 3 game, non-zero sum again, where all states but one are absorbing. The only non-absorbing state is this top left over there. All the other states are absorbing. All right? And so this is an absorbing game in its own right, but given that it's only a sub-game of the entire game, this is not an absorbing game. This is what we call, as I said, an irreversible game. An irreversible game, as the name suggests, is a game that once you leave a state, you can no never go back. All right? So eventually you go from here to there or here to there. Well, um, you have to actually do that in the first period. And after that, either you stay there if top left realizes, or you get absorbed in one of the remaining five states. Okay? Yes, I mean, I didn't write uh, all the letters because I don't really know. Player one chooses Player one chooses rows. Yes, yes. I'm not playing tricks on you. Player one will be the row player. Good. Is the game clear? All right. And obviously, you can see all the Nash of that subgame. All right. So, um, what are Nash? Um, let's see. I mean, the, the underlying techniques from undergraduate micro still works. So, minus one, minus one is a Nash. Um, three minus two is a Nash. And, uh, and then there's, of course, you know, it would be odd if we had an even number of Nash, so there's got to be a third one. Yes? For the minus 12, of course. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, yes, I should have started by saying public contribution games, for instance, all right? Uh, you know, economists, I should have mentioned, examples of famous stochastic games that are not known as stochastic games. Rubinstein's bargaining is, an is a stochastic game. It's a very simple absorbing state game. I didn't mention it because the action set is, is uncountable and I'm just talking about, right, it's, it's the, you, you, you announce any share you want. But it's an, absor it's an absorbing game because as soon as Eric says yes, the game is absorbed in the states pi 1 minus pi. All right. Uh, there is a large literature in economics on public contribution games at Maddie Perry, Max Matthews, I'm sure I'm ignoring many, where somehow, you know, a, be, a bridge has to be built and we need to contribute that much money and we pledge money. And, uh, and, and obviously, small steps is a good idea. You start a little bit and, you know, whatever you pledge, you can't go back. There are lots of such examples. I should have mentioned it. For that specific one, no. All right. So the third one is a mixed Nash which involves a mixture between top and bottom and middle and right. And uh, it so happens to be one third, two thirds, and one quarter, three quarter, just for completeness. You can check that. Uh, and that gives players a payoff minus five, minus six. So in terms of um, what happens in that sub game, we have three Nash, as I said, either we play top left or we play bottom middle or we randomize between top bottom and middle right. But you have to understand that because of the stars, in terms of evolution of the game, these look very different. All right? Top left doesn't end the game. The other, two mixed, uh, uh, the other two Nash end the game. If we ever play bottom middle, the game is over. And similarly, if he randomizes between middle right, one quarter, three quarter, and then randomize this way, the game is over. So if I'm thinking about what we can get in this stochastic game, once we enter it, it can only be a string of minus one, minus one, followed by either the vector three minus two or the vector minus five, minus six. Is that clear? We might never get there, but if we ever decide to switch after n periods to, uh, to an absorbing state, it's going to give us either this vector or the three minus two. So I can think about the payoffs in that sub-game, so to speak, as vector of the type 1 minus delta times minus 1 minus 1 or for n periods plus delta n u 
where u is either the vector minus 5 minus 6 or uh, what was the other one? Mi 3 minus 2. And here I really don't want Eric to help me with a randomization device. I don't want it. All right? It's important for their example. All right? So this is what would happen. This, this is, so n is an integer. All right? I can pick any integer, n, and it could be infinite, of course. We could just play minus 1, minus 1. All right? So n is an integer or plus infinity. All right? These are the payoffs we can get in the continuation. All right? Now, I'm going to focus on a subset of the unit interval. Uh, so let me write big delta to be those discount factors which have a very peculiar property. So delta will be the set of discount factors such as 1, the payoff from left, is exactly equal to uh, 1 minus delta power n minus 1 plus... I should erase here, plus the only thing that obviously the minus 5 minus 6 is not going to do to get an indifference, so I'm going to focus on the 3 minus 2. So uh, plus delta n times 3. All right, these are the discount factors, sorry, I should say for some n. These are the discount factors that would make player 1 just indifferent between left and right. Okay? And there, there, are not, there are not that many of them. There are countably many of those. Right? Because there are only, for each n, there exists exactly one discount factor that does the trick. Yes, Chang. Well, because n could be zero, so I, I don't know whether I just... We could immediately decide to go into playing bottom, middle, or the mixed one. But what we can do is play top left for, say, 10 periods, and afterwards we go to one of the absorbing one. All right? So if n were zero, we would immediately absorb. If n were infinity, we would never absorb. But we could coordinate, all right, on saying after 10 periods we play Nash, that Nash. That would be self-fulfilling, all right? Because these are Nash, uh, it would maybe not be the most desirable one for player two, but it would still be a Nash equilibrium. In fact, subgame perfect equilibrium of, of that. Yes? Why don't we have a mixed equilibrium where TL is also mixed in? Uh, because the payoffs have been chosen such that this does not occur. This is the beauty of the. My first reaction when Jerome and, and uh, Bruno Zilioto showed me that example is why don't you do it two by two? And I said, we really didn't. But anyhow, I'm not quite done with the example. So before saying why didn't we have that, the question is why did we show? All right, so let, can you hold on just a second and then we can revisit that question? No, just the, I'm satisfied with your answer. Yeah, okay, so they constructed in a way to kill it. Okay? The question was why isn't there another Nash? And it's because there isn't. The payoffs have been chosen so that there isn't. All right? In particular, he was curious, is there no Nash right there? All right? And so the third action was precisely meant to defeat that mixture. Right? So that action basically made it not, not a Nash. Okay. Now, this set delta, if you think about it and you just solve that thing, that gives us, is just precisely the one half, one power n, and an integer or infinite, including zero. All right, so it's, um, it's a very special set of, um, uh, in fact, the infinite is not going to work because I want discount factors less, less than one. So this is the set of discount factors that would actually make player one just indifferent. Yes? Still a step behind. Um, the one minus delta for an equation, is that a set of visible individual? individual no, I should have s said more specifically. This is the set of subgame perfect Nash equilibrium payoffs in the subgame, starting the first time we're here, which would mean actually it can only occur one way, which is if player one played right in the first period. So this is the set of continuation payoffs from the second period onward. Okay. Equilibrium payoffs, candidates, all right? I mean, they're not just candidates, they are, they are you know, but obviously we're gonna play only one. Good. Now, for those discount factors within that set, player one is willing to randomize. Okay, 
So if delta is in that set, let me write it here, if delta happens to be in this set, then E delta, the set of equilibrium payoffs on any E delta, but let's focus on subgame perfect here. I'm sorry, I'm just erasing the names. I need a little bit of space. So this will contain, player one will get one either way. So this will contain the, the, the one cross the interval minus one, one for player two. Why? Well, because player one gets one anyhow, and depending on the weight he puts on uh, left and right, we can give player two a payoff, let's say, anywhere between minus one and one. Okay, we can give him as high as one, uh, and obviously he, can, he gets either minus two or minus one there. So by the intermediate value theorem, you can get anything in between. You can get more, but that set is included there. Okay. On the other hand, if delta is not here, then either player two will get one. If player one plays left, oh, he'll get no more than minus one because he either gets minus one, minus six, minus two, or some weighted average of those. But he can't get anything above minus one if player one chooses to move right. So that said right there, is, uh, so I should say, if delta is not there, then E delta intersect 1 cross minus 1, 1 is empty. Okay? That's very frustrating because something that hadn't crossed my mind until this example is that perhaps the set of Kim pay of E delta might not converge. All right? So before asking, you know, when I gave the previous example of big match, uh, the pi match, I was thinking, okay, so what's the right limit, E delta in general? Here I'm saying, well, in general, it's not going to work. All right? It's not going to work because depending on the sequence of deltas that I take, I'm going to see different equilibrium payoff sets. All right? Is that clear? No. Right. I'm saying... Uh, if we want something like a Fogg theorem, amended for the fact that it's not going to be everything that is feasible and irrational, all right? This says that uh, if I'm looking at a sequence of discount factors, all right, and the corresponding echidon payoff, okay? And suppose that the sequence of echidon payoffs is convergent, all right? So for instance, if I take a discount sequence in that, if I take a sequence in this set, I'm going to have a convergent uh, limit, all right? And had I looked at another sequence converging to one, but that is not there, I'm going to get something else. So I won't even be able to talk about the limit set of equilibrium payoffs. All right? Now, you might see many things that are wrong with this example. You might say, well, maybe we should throw away that set because that set is zero measure. All right? And who knows whether one can construct a more robust example. And this one, as I said, is not an absorbing game. I do not know whether for absorbing games, we can construct such an example. Bruno says yes, Jérôme says no, <laughs> all right? So the jury is out whether, so this was an irreversible game, all right? It was a little more complicated than the previous. You can see how they use the fact that the set of equilibrium payoffs there is, is, is somehow, is, is, you know, is disconnected. And it would be hard to do with an absorbing game, but that doesn't mean that a counterexample doesn't exist, all right? But it means that if you want to go to reversible games, which are very natural because of contribu public contributions or, or bargaining, all right, we're going to have to be very careful about, uh, about how we take limits and how we think about those. Okay? Good. So these were all the bad news. I started with nice examples showing you how bad things can go, and I'm just concluding by saying you don't, don't even get convergence to begin with. Yes? Right. As far as I know, none of those have any of these pathologies. They all have much simpler structures. So you wonder whether there's some extra assumption what could make that if you start in the pieces, well, the pieces don't have problems. So what's going on? How come right. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, Rubinstein has some pathologies if you think about, for instance, discrete actions versus continuum. Well, you know, there, there's some patho but they're very different nature. That's right. There are lots of pathologies with Rubinstein's uh, bargaining, but they're not of that, that, that nature. I agree. The behavior in terms of delta is, is well behaved. And so, but, but you can see why I, I drew a connection between the disconnected set of offers because the, the, the convexity is somewhat reminiscent of the kind of problems. We, 
I don't know. So the answer is this. This is, this is a working paper, 2015. The question was up there. We don't get convergence. Exactly. To solve so, <laughs> absolutely. 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 So, absorbing game might be one class where that does not occur, and, you, and, and perhaps we can put some structure, ruling out minus 12s. So, putting some structure on that matrix that would help us. Sorry? Absolutely. Absolutely. So we have some interesting, so, th so the order of moves, for instance, is also reminiscent. We get discontinuities whether we look at simultaneous versus alternating. So there are also some pathologies in these games as well, which might not be entirely unrelated, but it's, it's, it's an open question. I should add, if you add a correlation device, that this, this disappears. All right? So there are other ways to fix it. Abraham would say, Abraham Neyman would say, use continuous time. It disappears. Uh, some people would say use a parameterization device, it disappears, or follow Drew's advice, come up with a nice characterization of the class of games for which we get convergence. That would be nice as well. All right? Good. So all, these, all this might be a little frustrating, and... That just says there are lots of challenges for young people here to actually work on that area. We know absolutely nothing about absorbing games that are non-zero sum, as I said. But there is a class of games for which we know a lot. And that's the one that Martin was alluded to, alluding to. A class of game for which, um, no matter what we do, eventually we might revisit every possible state. All right, so this is uh, the class of Irreducible games, so let me talk about those a little bit. So what's an irreducible game? An irreducible game is a game where if you fix A here to be some Markov policy, some, some stationary policy. And what I mean by that is if we focus on strategies sigma that are stationary, so sigma h n is simply a function a of the last state along the history h n. I haven't introduced that notation, but I, I hope it's uh, uh, sufficiently clear. It says this is the last state along that history. If, if what we do after a given history is just a function of the current state, I'm looking at pure even, all right, here, uh, then, then we're playing uh, what I call the, a Markov policy or a stationary policy. And we might think about those Markov chains P that arise if instead of looking at an arbitrary S, I look at a given Markov policy A of S, all right? So fix a Markov strategy A of S or Markov policy A of S. Now, if I fix this policy, I have now no longer a Markov decision process or a stochastic game. I just have a Markov chain, all right? I have a usual Markov chain, and you might ask, uh, you, might, uh, you might require this Markov chain to satisfy some standard assumptions on Markov chain, and one which is desirable is that it is irreducible, all right? So what I will want is that for any pair of states, I can find a time arbitrarily large, but finite, uh, a time such that starting in period zero in one state, the probability that I'm in the other state at any date later than that time is strictly positive. All right? And I want to impose that not just for one Markov policy, but for every Markov policy. All right? So it says no matter how we play, as long as we play Markovian, the resulting Markov chain will have a nice behavior asymptotically. It will revisit every state infinitely often, okay? So I'm gonna focus on those, and you realize that they rule out all the examples I used, okay? But, they, but Martin's example of how about we leave the absorbing state, that's one of those, okay? And in economics, there are lots of examples of that type as well. If we're thinking about shocks with unbounded support, or uh, if we think it's possible that from one period to the next, your type changes and no state is impossible, has a probability, I don't care how small it is, as long as it's bounded away, as, as long as it's bounded away from zero, I'm okay, all right? So this is a very special class of, ma of, of stochastic games, but those ones we understand very well. Okay? 
Our understanding is um, coming partly from uh, operations research and the case with one player. So let me say a few words about the one player case. And when I'm saying we understand very well, what do I mean by that? I mean, what can we say about the asymptotic behavior of the equilibrium pay offset? All right? For that class of games, we will get some sort of Falk theorem. So we will be able to say this is the limit of the equilibrium pay offset for any given initial state. As delta goes to 1, we'll be able to say that this set, this set converges. I mean, this limit is well defined, and we'll be able to characterize it. And this will include, as special cases, the Falk theorem of Drew, uh, Eric, and David, and it will also include, as special case, the results with one player, so the Bellman principle in the limit. All right, so the Bellman optimality equation, or whichever way you call it. So let me say a few words about that. And you might say, why do we need such, such an assumption? Well, I gave you plenty of reasons why we need to make some assumptions. And I'm going to give you one more. I'm going to show you what goes wrong even with one player when you make no restrictions on the transitions. All right, so if you, make, if you don't restrict these transitions some way like that, what goes wrong in the limit? All right, so. If you have only one player, uh, one thing you all know is the Bellman, the Bellman principle, all right? So the Bellman equation, and so let me just uh, go to that. So let's think about us having just one player. And so for a fixed discount factor, you use to the following equation that would characterize the value in any given state S, given the discount factor delta, which I will immediately erase, but it is a function of delta. V delta S will be uh, the maximum I just put the max above, just to be clear that I'm going to maximize the right-hand side, of 1 minus delta R S A S plus sum delta sum over the states we could be in to get tomorrow, P T S A S V T. All right, so that's Bellman's optimality or Bellman's principle for you. I immediately wrote A of S just to be clear that it's a function of S, but obviously that's what we're maximizing over. We're maximizing over the action A. And the theorem of Bellman tells us that there exists a unique solution V of S to that system which, and, 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 uh, which characterizes the optimal value of this problem and any selection of the argmax will be an optimal strategy. Okay? Now, since we're interested in asymptotics, when delta goes to 1 for the purpose of repeated games or stochastic games, you might also inquire what is the corresponding statement for the limit as delta goes to 1 from here. All right? And so some of you have seen it. Those of you who have seen uh, talks by me probably have seen it because I like this result very much, but it, I still think it's an, uh, underappreciated in economics. So let me just tell you what Bellman in the limit is. All right, so what's Bellman in the limit? So uh, you just need to make a very simple transformation to, uh, right, obviously you don't want to take delta in the right-hand side to 1, and that's that. If you take delta to 1 on the right-hand side, these terms disappears, and you get that V is the expectation of tomorrow's V, and that's actually kind of true, but not very insightful about what V is and how to compute it and what the optimal policy is. All right, so we need to do something a little more uh, clever in order to get there. So what we're going to do is something that uh, Drew uh, and Eric uh, and David do as well in their papers in repeated games. So we'll, we'll do the link next time, given the time left. Um, but uh, it, it is to somehow uh, not reason about continuation payoff, but variations in continuation payoffs, and, and divide by 1 minus delta. So let's, let's fix a state S star. So we fix a state. And I'm going to add and subtract um, uh, V star, so V of S star. Let's bear with me just a second. So I've added and subtracted here. Uh, I've added V and, and subtracted it, and I subtracted an, an, an additional delta V. And I'm going to write this is equal to max of 1 minus delta R S A S plus sum over t, p t s a s, v t minus v s star times delta. I, I forgot the delta. I wanted to put it there. Let's put it there. OK, I've just added and subtracted. Using the fact that these were probabilities adding up to 1, so my delta v s star that I subtracted 
is over there. Let me divide through by 1 minus delta everywhere. OK. And that sounds like a much better candidate for a limit Bellman equation. Let's call this term right there. Think, let's hope for a second that as delta goes to 1, I'm going to comment on that for a, in, in just a second, but let's assume that this converges to something. Let me call it theta of s. I'm going to get theta of s plus v s star is equal to max, sorry, is equal, is, is equal to the max over a of R S A S plus some T P T S A S. And here I'm cheating again because there is a delta here, but you know, delta is one. All right. So theta T. All right. And now this is a more interesting equation that probably not many of you have seen, which actually kind of uh, is, is, is not trivial. All right. So I'm saying here I have how many unknowns? I have this V of a star, which I will just call V star. And I have this function theta. OK? Now, for going from here to there to make sense, I need to revisit this operation right there. When is it that this converges to a nice limit? All right? It's not always true. It requires, first of all, that Vs converges to Vs star, namely that the initial state becomes irrelevant as delta goes to 1. Now, that's true when the Markov chain um, e induced by the optimal policy is irreducible because it means I'm going to revisit all states and as delta goes to 1, the time it takes to go from one to the other is bounded above in expectations. Okay? Second, it needs to be that this difference is precisely of this order. But that also makes a lot of sense because, uh, because the time it takes in expectation to go from S star to S or S to S star is precisely of the order of the flow payoffs. Right? It might take five periods or ten periods in expectation to go from one to the other. But whatever that is, it's like ten times one minus delta, approximately. Okay? So this equation is what's called the average cost optimality equation. So it's a Bellman equation in the limit. And it characterizes precisely the optimal long-run value as delta goes to 1 in any Markov decision problem that is irreducible in the, in the sense that I've defined. All right? And so more formally, I'm not going to write it down given for the sake of time, but more formally, there exists a unique V star that solves this equation alongside a theta s, which is unique up to a constant. And that should be shocking because I lost the delta. So there is no contraction, uh, there is no contraction element there. If I add a constant to theta s, to all theta s's, then obviously the equation remains valid. But up to that constant, additive constant theta is unique as well. All right? So yes, I Eric. I think you want to make that theta sub s. Yes, I want to be consistent with the theta t over there. I, it, I was thinking about it as well. Thank you, Eric. OK, so this is, uh, this is how you solve a Markov decision problem in the limit. And we will see next time how Drew's formula with David for repeated games is related to that and how for stochastic games we can get that formula more, more generally. But the point I want to emphasize here is even with one player, to get such a formula, we must assume that the Markov chain is well behaved. Okay. So that says that even with one player, when we're outside of the world of irreducible games, it is a hard problem. I should add that we do know now, in operations, the general Bellman equation in the limit for arbitrary chains. I gave you the simple one when this converges, but there is a coupled system which is called um, uh, the pair of optimality equation, which works for any Markov chain. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not aware of anyone having tried to use that to extend it to more than one player. And I'm not going to give it to you here, but I'm going to give it in the, f in, in the lecture notes and I'm going to send you, if you're curious, about what happens when the Markov chain is not irreducible. What is the right generalization of this formula um, otherwise? Okay, so that's somewhat anticlimactic to stop right there with this formula. But given the, given the time I have, I... I'll, I'll stop there and I, uh, you know, not surprisingly, I have less things to say anyhow about incomplete information, given that with even with complete information, we only have some puzzles rather than some results. Any questions? I should add, I'm going to leave on Tuesday, so I will miss 
the poster session. So if anyone wants to talk to me, today would be a good day. All right? I'd be in my office, 1.12, and otherwise tomorrow. Okay? Thank you very much.